say, you go up to the universal problem and take a thought or projection, it'll rapidly converge as you type it. So that's more or less the same as this, where you have a unique representative of each context <coughs> class, and there's some very simple process of getting to it. And that happens in hyperbolic groups. Okay? There's a rapid solution to the congruency problem. What you do is, so given two words, U and V, you tighten, uh, tighten to cyclically reduced, cyclically reduced uh, eight delta plus four, I think it is, local geodesics. Now, because we've got a Dane algorithm, you do that very quickly, okay? So you think of the word, and you make it geodesic, or you make it locally geodesic, okay? You just make sure that each segment up to eight, like eight delta is, is a geodesic. Tighten locally, and do it cyclically, so you get these words u bar and v bar. So then, there exists uh, some w of uniformly banded size, I think it's 4 delta plus 4. I might have made that up, there's lots of constants. Uh, so that uh, W conjugates one to the other. So it's extremely rapid. Okay, you just you look, you make them local geodesics. That's the tightening process on the surface, and then it's not quite like the free group where they'll really be equal, but they're almost equal. The length of the conjugating element is really short. Okay? Again, I've missed out a cyclic permutation here. These are cyclic words. You have to rotate them. So that's extremely short. Certain polynomial time solution. It's really linear because the process of typing them just uses Dane's algorithm. Uh, and, and then there's this RAM business kind of stuff. So we like that, okay? So you know, when you're approaching group theory, so the fundamental thing you, you problem you face are the lines in the universe, most things are undecidable. In the hyperbolic world, most things are decidable. And the negative curvature gives you extremely rapid solutions to basic decision problems like conduits. So, so how much of this can we carry to non-positive perspectives? The other most important decision problem is the isomorphism problem. Okay, now this is probably the single greatest theorem about hyperbolic groups is uh, there are solutions to the isomorphism problem. There are some caveats there about really and decomposable torsion free and things that other people had to work very hard to sort out. But the theorem mostly concerns uh, uh, serious contributions from other people is the isomorphism problem. Is solvable. Amongst hypotheses. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me just, I mean what I say, but you have to be careful about this. What that means is the isomorphism problem means somebody gives you two finally presented groups, you go to your machine and you ask it, are these groups isomorphic? It will eventually stop and you come back and you say yes or you say no and you're telling the truth. That's the ice, that's a solution to the isomorphism. When you say the isomorphism problem is solvable amongst a class of groups, what that means is somebody gives you two groups and says, I promise you these groups are in the class, and then you'll go away and come back to the answer. If they lie to you, that's their problem. Okay? The answer might be wrong, or you might never come back with an answer. What it means is as long as they weren't lying, as long as they gave you two hyperbolic groups, you went away, you can answer, are they, are they isomorphic, and come back. Okay? That's a fantastic theorem. We like this to be true in greater generality. To be true for non-positive curve groups, semi-hyperbolic groups, whatever we're going to call them. Now, I'll talk about this. I will talk about this. And for when you, about how, when you relax what you mean by non-positively curved group. 
At one point, the isomorphism problem becomes unsolvable. Okay, so there is something which might reasonably be thought of as a class of non-positive curve groups, but the isomorphism problem is proved to be unsolvable. Right? Now that was unknown for a long time. It's kind of an interesting thing. So as you walk down the side of this universe, by the time you come to what are called commable groups, the isomorphism problem is unsolvable. And I'm hoping to explain that to you tomorrow. Oh. But the first class of, of, of you know, so the most cl so the classic non-positive curve groups is, is open. So open question, which I increasingly think the answer is no. But is the isomorphism problem? Solvable in, I'm going to ask two things. Okay? So, first of all, class of cat zero groups. Okay. I set of those gamma, so gamma x, property and cocompactly, property and cocompactly, by some Is the, is the isomorphism problem with solvable We don't know that, right? And just, just no idea. Uh, it's a great problem, and to solve it in any significant subclass is a great theorem. Okay? And, and there should be positive results. Here's the class I'd like, most like to know about. How about the fundamental groups of compact non positive curve manifolds? Now, in dimension three, the answer is yes. In dimension four, I don't think we can know. Okay. Now, why is that particularly important? Well, because if they're classical objects, for one reason, okay. Uh, but there's a, there's a more profound reason. Is that what we like to classify manifolds. Now, you can't classify manifolds exactly because of the fundamental group. Okay. The homeomorphism problem is unsolvable for, for manifolds. As soon as you Dimension it gets higher. So is that inversion of the complex function? Sorry? Is that inversion of the complex function? Uh not obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, so I suspect it's the already unsolvable there. So yeah. Cat zero Q complex views. Even two-dimensional ones. <laughs> now, all these are great questions. Uh, yeah, fix that last one. Cat zero just one. So let, let me just talk for a minute about the classification of manifolds, which is why we care so much about this problem. So the great theorem of Farrell and Jones that says uh, if there are n is at least six. Then uh, and an M and N closed, negatively curved, um, then M is homeomorphic, not diffeomorphic, but homeomorphic to N, if and only if the fundamental group is the same. So then follows from Zeller's theorem that the homeomorphism problem, that is deciding uh, if two given manifolds are homeomorphic or not, is decidable. There is an algorithm that given in a recursive way, given two negatively curved manifolds, or just given two manifolds and told they have metrics of negative curvature, that's all you need. Um, right. Or negatively curved manifolds. I think it's every dimension except four of those. I'll say six points, it's like those. Uh, right, wonderful thing. Right? So, so Zeller's theorem combined with, combined with Fowl Jones says you can recognize which manifold is which amongst negatively curved manifolds in high dimensions. But Fowl and Jones later turned this into non positively curved. So that theorem remains true in non-positive curvature. So if you could solve the isomorphism problem for fundamental groups of non-positive curve manifolds, you'd be able to solve the homeomorphism problem, a 
and know which high dimensional manifolds of non positive curvature are involved. Okay. We don't know that. That's, uh, that's not a problem. But okay. Back to the main gist of it. We can solve the isomorphism from the hyperbolic groups. We'd like to be able to do it when we will move into the world of non positive curvature. Right. Leave to the bottom of page one. to motivate which bits of the definition we'd like to hang on to. And I think uh, I do things are slightly different order here. So what number was I up to? Was that four? Five uh, centralizers <coughs> and <even coughs> subgroups. So uh, I was going to go through the proof of this, but I'll, I'll do it in a Later, okay. So if gamma, so if gamma is hyperbolic, and uh, gamma has infinite order, then, as we all know, the cyclic subgroup generated by gamma is, 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 is the quasi I.e., the map n goes to gamma to the n. Map from uh, Z to gamma, or K graph to gamma, is a quasi geodesic. The way you prove that normally is to go via uh, the fact that uh, gamma has a finite index in the centralizer. So what you're actually proving is that uh, the, the cyclic group by gamma, uh, generated by gamma, goes into the centralizer of gamma, and that's finite index, but in particular it's quasi-symmetric embedding, and then you prove that that is quasi-symmetric embedding. This is actually the way the proof goes. Okay. And I'll tell you that's the way the proof goes because that is a proof I want to copy in other contexts of non-positive curve. Okay. Um, so in this case, we know there's no Z plus Z subgroups. The centralizer is just a finite extension of Z. It'll be more complicated in non-positive curve, but nevertheless, we'll do something like that. Okay. So we understand centralizers and hyperbolic groups, and somehow the way in which you understand them, as you think carefully about them, is something you can carry over to other contexts. But I want to say something more about the way. Uh, so this tells you if you're in a hyperbolic group and you start just taking inputs of gamma, gamma, gamma squared, gamma cubed, and so on, you, you'll get a nice quasi line in there. So in particular, it tells you that the translation of that. Another important idea that we want to take forward in translation length. So oh, I don't have to write this. Let me write translation. Which is the limit. If you've never seen this exercise, you should see why the limit exists. So the distance from 1 to gamma n divided by n. Okay, so that, that will tell you some how far you're going here as you go along. But that is positive. Now, there's a remarkable theorem strengthening this. Okay. So this is, uh, I promise, I want to translate this. Is, this is translation of this. There's a wonderful theorem of Gromov, which has got a very elegant proof by Gelson, which is, in fact, there exists an integer n so that Take all of the, uh, the translation numbers. Their numerators are all bounded, so that that, uh, that is actually. So I said that's like it's just the 
translation numbers uh, all have uh, rational numbers of a banded, banded denominator. Okay, so if you multiply them, you all get. So in particular, in particular, the set of, and this is slightly easier to prove, is a discrete set of rational numbers. Now that's really very odd. Right? You got something as a limit, and it turned out to be rational, and knowing it turned out to be rational is pretty close to being an integer. Okay? Does this continue? So question. Does this or do these phenomena continue in non-positive terms? So is, is this something you can hope will continue in non-positive curve groups? Will these translation numbers always be positive? Well, that will have something to do with whether groups, with whether there's a sort of axis for elements acting on the Cayley graph. Okay. Will that be generic behavior? Will these numbers be positive? Will they be sort of discrete? Will they form this nice discrete set? Both of those questions are going to turn out to be important. So both the, 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 both the positivity of translation numbers and the discreteness of this set are important features of hyperbolic geometry that we want to hang on to in more broad context. And we'll see that when you try to prove various things you want to prove, both of these phenomena turn out to be uh, key obstructions. Okay. Right. As we're fiddling around with different definitions of non-positive curvature, where we will both turn out to be positivity and discreteness of the set of translation numbers will both turn out to be important properties. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to skip over the next couple of things, I think, in the interest of time, because I really want to get this. So, so six, uh, so is the theorem of gamma is hyperbolic when gamma has only Finite many conjugacy classes. Conjugacy classes. The finite subgroups. This is one of those theorems that there are several false proofs of in the literature. Um, and it's based on a misapprehension. It's worth knowing. Um, we know uh, that the, the group acts properly and co compactly on a contractible finite dimensional CW complex. So if somebody with enough gray hair says to you, that means that any finite subgroup will have a fixed point, you might be scared into believing them. You shouldn't believe them. That's a common misconception, and somebody will mumble something about group cohomology at that point, and that's sort of right, but it's not quite right. What is true is that a finite P group, a finite group whose who's, uh, who's, uh, who's orders of power is some finite P, acting on a contractual finite dimensional CW complex will have a fixed point for homological reasons. But for finite simple groups, it's not true. Okay, you don't have to have a global fixed point. And so you cannot deduce this theorem from the, the existence of, of, of a finite uh, or, or, or the fold classifying space or all space. Okay? What you have to do here, the proof, is to mimic mi mimic the Cartan Cartan's proof in the classical setting, in the relating cat zero setting, or as I've never heard of cat zero spaces, but he's doing it on symmetric spaces of non-positive type. If you've got a, a group in a classical setting acting on, say, on a Euclidean space, to make it easy, or hyperbolic space, if, if this is a finite group, a finite subgroup, then all you do is you take a G orbit. So you take the favorite point and you take the G orbit. In, in, in a symmetric space, or an Euclidean space, or a hyperbolic space, or a cat zero space, there'll be a unique smallest ball enclosing any finite set. That unique smallest ball has a center, and so since G is acting by isometries, it will fix the center. So every finite subgroup will have a fixed point when it acts in the cat zero space. The proof I'm sure you all know. You just mimic that proof in the hyperbolic world. Okay, you just take a point, you take the orbit of that point. Now, it will, there will not be a unique smallest ball, but this being hyperbolic world, there will be a fuzzy, unique, fuzzily unique smallest ball. 
the centers of all of the unique small fall will, find, will form a uniformly bounded subset. It will be a finite subset whose size depends only on its delta. And therefore, you, you, if you take a high enough power, you'll fix the point there. So, so that's how you, you just mimic the Kantan's classical proof, uh, but in the latter system, you prove this thing. So again, it's to do with behaving coarsely like a cat minus one space, or a cat zero space. I should have said, actually, Dennis Oden reminds me of this in the excellent break. This, this was Grosvenor's famous question, famous question for years, and he tried really hard to do this. So this is seriously open. Grosvenor from the prime couldn't do this. Uh, is every hyperbolic, let's say, torsion free hyperbolic group? Fundamental group of a compact uh, locally cat zero or even cat minus one space. It's very, everything I'm saying about hyperbolic groups, right, they behave incredibly like fundamental groups of honestly negatively curved spaces. So much so that nobody's ever found anything to distinguish them. This is still unknown. Are hyperbolic groups, now, instead of just having coarse negative curvature, do you really actually have honest local negative curvature for all hyperbolic groups? That's one of the great things that just was never solved that. Okay, so I want to mention that. So finite subgroups, as we generalize to other classes of non positively curved groups, will we keep this lovely classic fact about lattices? that persists in hyperbolic groups that we have when we find any many consciously classes of finite subgroups that's definitely something we like. Oh damn, do I have to stop do I have to stop? Uh, well, this is a bit late. I reckon you can easily take about eight minutes. I can have, okay, thank you. I literally only need five minutes. So uh, this now so seven. Right. Now this is what Drogos called markup problem. But this I want to talk about because it's the beginning of hyperbolic groups. Oh, they're both Okay. So, um, I like the theorem. I don't want to spend the next five minutes doing definitions, so I, I'll just sort of, I'll just sort of. If you don't know what some of the words mean, I'm going to define it and then come back to it. This is due to Jim Cannon. So, if gamma is hyperbolic, so let's give it a, 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 a final presentation. Then, the set of geodesic words, okay, so that's the, the just the words, so I'm writing like that, that's the free model, that's just words, okay, that's just the words in the generators. So it's just a set of words. You think it's a language, okay? Is a vector language. Okay, so this is our first foray into formal language theory. I.e., um, there exists a finite state automaton, which is a particularly easy sort of machine. It's the first and most easy to build them out of wooden bricks. You know, it's the most naive sort of machine in computational theory, uh, or M, uh, with, with uh, tape alphabet. So you just, you know, this is some sort of simple machine. You can feed in a, a machine with a tape with words written on it, uh, and, and the, and the uh, alphabet is just being generated to the group. Um, so that the set of accepted